Hi, I'm Jason Norris, and this is episode six of Podcast Local from On The Go FM. Do you use music in your local podcast? It's not required, of course, but it can enhance the listening experience, if it's appropriate and used effectively. Well, coming up, the importance of choosing music wisely, and something you can do to create a unique podcast theme. And finally, one artistic technique for mixing music into your show. Support for Podcast Local comes from the Satchel Podcast Player for Android and iPhone. Satchel has a feature that makes finding local podcasts easy. Learn more or register your podcast at satchelplayer.com. Music is a powerful force. It's hard to imagine Star Wars without John Williams. Music sets the tone, but it can also change the meaning of the spoken word. Good music enhances everything you're working on. Cheesy music, stereotypical music, too much music can ruin everything you're working on. For local podcasters, music choice is a challenge that should not be taken lightly. When my wife and I recorded the first behind-the-scenes episode introducing our plans to produce a local podcast for our city of Fort Worth, Texas, I decided to add some music. So I went to audioblocks.com and started searching for terms like Western, Texas. I even tried Fort Worth just to see if there was anything there. I found plenty of music to enhance our show. But I also found a bit of fear and trepidation. Is this music actually appropriate for a Fort Worth podcast? What do you think about when you hear the name Fort Worth? Or Texas? Or Cowtown? Or the phrase, Where the West Begins? Surely something like this seems to fit, right? Or maybe this. I would not have hesitated to select music like that if it weren't for the fact that Fort Worth, Texas is known for much more than cattle drives and cowboys. Van Cliburn was from here. There's the Fort Worth Symphony. There's the opera. What is the music of Fort Worth? If you were to poll every citizen of this city, what music would they say actually represents their own town? Now, I think the first time I ever thought about anything like this was when I worked at Alabama Public Radio. We aired a syndicated show called Thistle and Shamrock. When I think of Irish and Celtic music, I think of something like this. Or something like this. And when you listen to the Thistle and Shamrock, you will hear music like that. But you'll also hear music that sounds nothing like that. As it says on their About page, Thistle is your weekly bridge between the established architects of Celtic Roots music and the rising generation of musicians. Music evolves over time. What might have been the music of a particular place in the past might be cliché today. I'll still use music with traditional Western influences in our Fort Worth podcast, but I'm going to be extra careful about crossing that line into stereotype and cliché. Yeah, that was the plan. And just a few Fort Worth episodes later, we moved to the east side of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. It's still Texas, it's still DFW, but it feels different here. And I've got more exploring to do before I start choosing music and telling the stories of our new community.
By the way, if you have a local podcast or want to start one, I've got a guide featuring seven ways you can tell the stories of your community. It's free when you sign up for the On The Go FM update. Just go to podcastlocal.com to learn more. That's podcastlocal.com. If you need theme music for your podcast, there are several places that sell royalty-free music. And I currently use Audioblocks. It's a subscription service that lets you pay once per year and access their entire catalog of royalty-free music. You can look for just one theme or use it like I do. I like to add pieces of music at various points during the episodes. I'll include a link to Audioblocks in the show notes for this episode. Now, I was lucky enough to find them last year around the holidays. They were doing a half-price special. Now, I don't know for sure if they're going to do that again, but it wouldn't hurt to check them out. Now, I think it's a great service, but one of the potential problems you run into with any royalty-free music service like that is someone else might also choose the same theme you chose for your show. Not too long ago, I was listening to a podcast and I heard some very familiar music. And then I realized it was the theme that I had chosen for the Meta Podcast series I recorded during the first quarter of 2016. Well, there is a way to get a unique theme, something you won't hear on anyone else's show. If you're a composer, of course, you could create something original. But if you're not a composer, you can still make this work. You need two things. First, a song or a tune that is in the public domain. And second, a musician. Now, if that inspires you and you're ready to go make a theme, please stick around for some important legal information. Oh, and if a public domain song doesn't appeal to your musical taste, keep listening. A good musician can perform a public domain song in a way that doesn't sound old at all. All right, so first of all, the song needs to be in the public domain. That means there is no copyright on the music, or the lyrics, or both. But, of course, if you're planning to make a theme with this, you're probably focusing more on the tune than on the words. So how do you find out if a song is in the public domain? Well, I'll tell you after this obligatory disclaimer. I am not a copyright lawyer. I don't even play a lawyer in audio dramas. I'm just passing along information that I've found. Okay, one of the first steps you can do is to check out the Public Domain Information Project. It's online at pdinfo.com. Now, they have a search feature that lets you look for a song title. And they explain the way that public domain works in the United States. Other countries may have different rules and regulations, and so you'll have to search for that in your country. In the United States, a song is in the public domain if it was published in 1922 or earlier. So if you find an old book or sheet music with a copyright date of 1922 or earlier, that song should be free to use. However, there is something to watch for. Music changes over time, and we might still sing the exact same lyrics from a song that's clearly old enough to be in the public domain, but the arrangement of that song might have been created yesterday, and in that case, the arrangement is not in the public domain. Now, you see this in church hymn books, for example. Sometimes a writer of the lyrics also wrote the tune, but sometimes you'll see that they are different or you'll see that the songbook's arrangement was composed later and that there is a copyright still in place. pdinfo.com actually has a feature that allows you to buy sheet music reprints of books and music published in 1922 or earlier so that you can have a hard copy proof that the song is in the public domain at least in the United States, and that you have a legal right to use it. Now, before you choose your music, I suggest reading their Frequently Asked Questions page completely, and I'll leave a link to it in the show notes for this episode. Okay, now the second thing you need is a musician. This could be you, or it could be a friend, or it could be anyone whose music you enjoy. 
the musician could simply perform the public domain arrangement on instruments of your choice. However, if the musician is also a composer or improviser, he or she can make that old song sound new. Now, think about the style that you want. What best represents you, your show, your audience? And then see what the musician can do with that. And of course, you probably are already thinking about this. If the musician creates or composes or significantly improvises the public domain tune, then that new arrangement is under a new copyright, the copyright of the musician. So again, with that obligatory legal disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer, but here's what I can tell you. You'll need to make an agreement with that musician, and you should pay the musician for her or his work. The basic elements you need in this agreement are, one, that the musician is giving you full permission to use their arrangement and performance in your own work. Number two, you are free to use that music in whole or in part in any way you wish forever. You might want to edit the music later if you're good at editing like that. And even though you're thinking just about your podcast right now, what if you wanted to create an audiobook later and sell that on your website? Or you might decide to start a brand new podcast and use the same piece of music. Now, those are just a couple of reasons that you need wording like that in your agreement. Number three, what you pay is between you and the musician. You might even offer that musician the rights to play the tune elsewhere, just as long as you can still use the music any way you wish. But that's up to you. And again, I'm not a lawyer, but those are items I suggest you include. By the way, I did this. I found a song that was in the public domain, and it was called Teach Me Thy Way, O Lord by Benjamin M. Ramsey, and he wrote both the lyrics and the tune. And then I asked my musician friend, Michael Pollard, if he could perform the song, but with a more contemporary style. And to demonstrate the changes that he made, first of all, here is a little bit of the, the basic song performed on a piano. And then Michael Pollard gave it a bit of country and western flavor. And here is his version. He actually created several tracks, different versions. The longest version was just over two minutes, but he also created a 60-second version because I wanted to use the music as an opening billboard, which is basically the start of a show that introduces what the show is about. I used the more Western-sounding portions of the song as uh, the theme for On the Go in Fort Worth. And lately, I've been using a different part of the song for Podcast Local. Now, you could also consider asking your musician for 30-second versions, 60 seconds, or, or even shorter ones. You can use what's often called interstitial music as a transition from one segment to another, or from the content of your show to a sponsor, or vice versa. He created several, and uh, here are a couple of them. And then this one. Now, something you might think about. Sometimes you might need to move from a serious or somber type of story or a discussion into something lighter. Or you might want to reverse that. Something, you know, that was lighthearted and fun, but you need to now move into something more serious. Well, you could have the musician create interstitials that start slow and end upbeat, or they start fast and then end slowly. 
What you decide to do with it is up to you and, of course, the creativity of your musician. And I hope that helps you make a unique theme for your show. And if you do this, let me know. I'd like to hear what you come up with. Podcastlocal.com will take you to the network home for this show, and there's a contact page with several ways you can share your comments or questions. That's podcastlocal.com. Coming up, an editing technique with music that will help many local podcasters communicate more clearly. Right now, I want to thank local podcaster Bo York for sponsoring Podcast Local. He's the host of Let's Talk Jackson, a local podcast in southern Mississippi, and he also runs a podcast network. But he's also created something that local podcasters can get excited about. It's the Satchel Podcast Player. It's an app for listening to podcasts, but it has a couple of features that you might want to take advantage of. First of all, the Satchel Player has a local button. Wherever you are, when you click local, you'll see a list of podcasts in your area. Some of those shows will be focused on the local community, and others will be locally sourced. In other words, they might not have a local show, but there is a podcaster near you that you might want to connect with. The second feature could be financially rewarding to you. There's a donate button associated with each show. If a listener is using the Satchel Player and they like what they hear, they can click that donation button and send you some money to help you keep on podcasting. To take advantage of those features, just go to satchelplayer.com and register your show. That's free. The app is free. It's available on Android and iPhone. Encourage your listeners to try out the Satchel Player. You can find out all you need to know at satchelplayer.com. That's satchelplayer.com. Com. Okay, let's say you've decided you want to use music in your episode, interstitials or even as music beds for part of your content. Now, there are different ways to do this, and since it's your show, you're free to do it however you choose. I'm going to share one technique I've picked up. The idea is to use music grammatically. In other words, think of music as punctuation in paragraphs. Use music to underline and emphasize certain comments, or drop the music occasionally to make bold, dramatic statements. I first heard about this idea on an episode of How Sound with Rob Rosenthal, and ever since I've been attempting to apply the principles to my own editing. One of the goals I have for the On The Go FM network is to encourage teachers to create on-the-go learning, especially using audio podcasts. So previously, I've produced an episode that dealt with the principle of teaching. In that episode, it was just me, just talking. I wrote the episode with a few transition paragraphs, and if I were giving a speech or teaching a class, those transitions and my physical visual cues would help people follow along a lot better. However, in audio podcasting, it's just your voice. And sometimes it's easy for your listeners to lose focus and get lost. Music, and occasionally sound effects, can help keep listeners engaged. Well, on this particular episode, I shared four stories that illustrated the four different ways your prior knowledge can affect new learning. And in order to keep listeners engaged, I decided to enhance the show with transition music between those four points. Now, I had a choice. I could either start each point with music, or I could end each point with music. And I think either way would have been fine. But in this case, I chose to end each point with music. I placed the music right at the last paragraph of each point. And then, when the music stopped, that sudden silence provided a dramatic pause that brought attention to the start of the next point. Now, I want to share that with you. It's from the actual episode. I mean, it's not the whole episode. It's just those transitions. Now, the whole thing here is about three minutes. But I want to give you enough so that you can get in the mood of the piece, so you can hear, but also even feel, what the musical transitions are doing. So, to start with, you'll hear point one and then the musical punctuation. 
and then point two, and the musical punctuation, and then finally the start of point three, and then I'll be back right after that. So, here we go with point one. The principle is that prior knowledge can help or hinder learning, and the key here is the quality of that prior knowledge. These are the factors that affect the quality of prior knowledge. First of all, prior knowledge is either activated or inactive. Let's say you're teaching history or political science, and previously you taught your students about the Constitution. But then one day, you notice something in the news that is clearly related to the First Amendment, and you decide this current event is so important that you just have to talk about it with your learners. As you're telling them about the news story, you notice they seem bored. Of course, you're thinking, how could anyone be bored hearing about this? Well, one possible reason is your learners may not see the relevance of the news story, at least not at first. The reason is their prior knowledge is inactive. Inactive prior knowledge can hinder learning, but activating that prior knowledge can lead to much better understanding. And keep in mind that most people are not as excited about what excites you. You might think, how could they not see that connection? But if they're new, new to the subject or a particular job, they won't have the same level of engagement as you. Sometimes it's hard to remember what it's like to be new. So, as the teacher, activate their prior knowledge. Now, the next factor that can affect the quality of prior knowledge is when it is sufficient or insufficient. Consider the difference between knowing what a recipe says versus actually cooking dinner. Pancakes were always tricky. I would look at the directions on the side of the box and what to do to make pancakes is listed there, step by step. Just follow those steps and soon you'll be enjoying a stack of buttery, syrupy pancakes. Question. Have you ever burned dinner without even cooking it completely? How can it be charred on the outside and still gooey in the middle? Well, that's the difference between knowing what and knowing how. Since there are different levels of knowledge, the prior knowledge of your learners, no matter how accurate it is, can still be insufficient when you're teaching them something new. Insufficient prior knowledge can hinder learning, but you as a teacher can assess the level of knowledge they have and design your instruction in a way that helps them grow from knowing what to knowing how. By the way, I actually have learned to cook a lot of things. Took a lot of time, practice, and disappointing dinners. But once my knowledge of cooking was sufficient, I have actually wowed my wife with some meals. All right, now for the third factor that affects the quality of prior knowledge. This is when it is appropriate or inappropriate for the specific context of the new thing they are learning. Okay, so that's how I used music to help separate the points that I was making in the episode. And now I'll do one more. Now, you might have heard this one already if you listened to episode four of Podcast Local. This will be a behind-the-scenes look at the making of that segment. Now, my goal in that episode was to point out how important the history of your community is. And as a local podcaster, you can research that history and tell the origin stories and other major events that shaped your community. Now, in order to make that point, I didn't lead with all of that in the segment. Instead, I asked you to think about your origin story, your own personal history, your own life. And then I included the music at a particular place that helped to emphasize that point. And it happened near the middle of the story. So it was a transition from you to your community. Now, here's a two-minute excerpt from that episode. You came from some place. In time, that time was different. Your world was different. You even understand the world today in a different way than you did then. You experienced life. 
from the place and time you were born. You grew. You changed. You came to understand things you didn't know before. You didn't just show up. You grew into the person you are now. Who you are today is a mix of nature and nurture, experience and time. You didn't just appear as you are now. And neither did your community. Your community didn't just appear as it is now. Your state, your city, your neighborhood, your church, your team, your community. It didn't just show up. It grew into the place you see today. Your local community today is a mix of time and experiences. Your community has experienced life. From the place and time it was formed, it grew, it changed, it became something complex. Your community became the place it is over the course of time. Okay, so there are two examples of using music grammatically in specific spots in order to communicate more clearly. By the way, it's often an experiment. You try, you tweak, you start over. But you finally have to publish. Sometimes it's effective, and sometimes you listen and wish you had chosen differently. But as with all skills, it takes practice. And that's what I'm doing. I'm practicing and publishing. I'm exploring different ways to communicate. So how about you? How did you choose your theme? Where did you get it? What tips do you have for more effectively using music in podcasts? Share your ideas with me at podcastlocal.com. That's podcastlocal.com. I'm Jason Norris, and I thank you for listening to Episode 6 of Podcast Local from On The Go FM.